quite lucky to be born in a family where uh, gender equality um, was a thing. But I'm, I'm very aware that that's not the case for every family. We shouldn't be talking about men role and women role. Uh, we should start considering us as human and everyone has to bring something to the table no matter what sexuality, gender, religion they are. What we need to learn is the, the way that how we communicate it really impacts on others and we have to be really careful on the words we pick every time. No sound? Is that okay? Wonderful. Good morning, everybody. I'm Inge Kerklodi Wief. I'm the director of the Innovation and Entrepreneurship Center at HEC Paris. And I'm so delighted and honored to moderate this uh, panel this morning. Women entrepreneurs are facing a lot of barriers, even more than their male uh, counterparts, even though when it comes to funding. So we'd like to see this gender gap going down and giving the full opportunities to women entrepreneurs to pursue their um, entrepreneurship journey. Um, they will have a positive impact on social, for sure, but also on economy. So I would like to introduce my distinguished panelists, having uh, Paolo Grue with us, CEO of PNG Italy. Welcome, Paolo. Thank you very Pleased much for joining. Here. Monica Poggio, she is the CEO of Bayer in Italy, and she's also the president of the Italian-German Chamber of Commerce. Anne Ramanou, thank you very much. I just didn't manage it to say in the very Italian way. So Anne, very warmly welcome to you. You are the CEO and founder of the Global Invest Her, and you're also a member of the EU delegation to W20. Welcome, thank you very much for being here. Alessio Botta, you are a senior partner from McKinsey. Thank you so much for joining this morning. To introduce the session, uh, we really can see that there is a big gender gap in women entrepreneurship. Only 30% of women-led uh, companies uh, are on, on the marketplace today. And when you have a look to the funding part, it's even worth. You can see that only 2% of the private equity worldwide is going to startups founded by with female founders. Those, there's a big gap. What we can see at the university and the school is even though we have only 50% of our women taking projects, really being able to go for a project, so we end up with only 25% of women entrepreneurs, even in the younger generation. So, we can see that women entrepreneurs are facing a problem of self-confidence and they also, they are really fear to fail. So if we consider that the economy of startups we are creating today will be part and an important part of the economy tomorrow, we really need to take action immediately because otherwise we will end up with a, an eco economy, sorry, which even will be less gender balanced. I would like to hand over immediately to Anne Ravanona. Um, again, you are the founder and CEO of, of uh, Global Investor. You are UE, de, EU delegation member of uh, W20. And would you share with us a little bit what you can see? Where do we stand today on this funding, um, funding opportunity and challenge for women entrepreneurs? start by saying, I'm going to give you some good news and some bad news. Let's always start with the bad news. Okay, so the bad news is that today the credit gap, the amount of funding that male entrepreneurs and female entrepreneurs get, that gap has been estimated before COVID by the IFC to be $1.7 trillion. That's the difference in money going to male or female founded companies. Today, my, I have a daughter and a son. Today, if my 20-year-old daughter went to set up her company and my 18-year-old son went to set up his company, my son would be 70% more likely to get funding just because of his gender. He doesn't even have to be good, okay? Inga's mentioned some of the statistics from venture capital. So this is the bad news, we'll get it over first. So 
Only 2% of venture capital worldwide goes to female only founded teams. To mixed teams, it's around 11%. But the thing is, that hasn't changed in 30 years. This is not a recent phenomenon. So this is decking. And then you say, OK, it's just a question of let's, let's get more investors. Well, there's a problem there. It's like this, the money's not getting to the women, but the number of investors are not there. So about 8% of venture capitalists are women and only about 14 to 20 percent of business angels so private investors are women so at the moment it's been managed by men okay a world of men and so on so that was the bad news right we got that over that's the reality now the good news is that today and tomorrow if we invest in women entrepreneurs our colleagues at mckinsey have estimated that that could add 13 trillion dollars to the global economy now, if there isn't a better business case than that, I don't know what it is. So that's very, very important. And I really believe that women entrepreneurs were the greatest untapped resource to reignite the economy. Because when you invest in us, we have a multiplier effect. We create more jobs and we also um, invest in, in, in the community. So my message is let us build forward better together by investing in women entrepreneurs. And I'll tell you more later. Is there anything public and private sector can do probably collectively to so support more women entrepreneurs? Absolutely. So let's start with public. Um, so I'm part of, the e, uh, part of the W20, which is the official engagement group to the G20 on women's issues. Okay. And in our communique in July, one of our key measures that we put forward for public investment as a, as a public um, uh, policy one of our key measures is that governments could invest and should invest a minimum of one percentage point of the new 15 percent corporation tax a minimum of that in female founders and guess what the great news is that if you do that you have an immediate effect because they're going to get money back in corporation tax in job creation and in income tax so you don't have to wait for it to happen and we are so happy and honored that um, Chiara and the G20 have kind of built on that idea from our, our, what we gave in to the G20 in July, have built on that idea in the action plan here at the Women's Forum. Because that's it, we need to find good ideas and also use best practices in different countries and great ideas to build on them to share with governments around the world. So from a public section, it's like, number one, this 15% corporation tax is manna from heaven. The governments weren't expecting it. So we needed to find a solution that doesn't cost them money, that will, that will um, actually create jobs and could potentially save money. <clears throat> that's what it all does with this measure. So that's the first thing. The second thing is for public procurement, <clears throat> we also put forward in our communique that governments should, each national government needs to do what's worked for them. But we suggest that they should increase um, public procurement by 10 percentage points from their baseline, whatever it is they're starting at, by 2030. So 10 percentage points from their starting point to go to female founded companies. So that's on the public sector. But not on the private sector, because OK, like, so the public, we're going to go to the governments. And those of you, it's Italian ministers who are listening, please hear the W20. We have these good ideas. Now on the second one, what can we do? What can you do? So on the private side, you can become an angel. You can invest in women entrepreneurs yourself. The first way you can do that is through crowdfunding. And if you are, have some disposable income, you can invest in a startup. So this can be done and there are ways to learn about it. Come to me if you want to learn more. But my key call to action, Inga, is buy from women entrepreneurs. The best form of funding is a paying customer. And everybody in this room can actually buy from, just go out of your way to find a company that is making the product or service you're looking for from a woman entrepreneur. And at Global Invest Her, we've created a global directory so you can find them. It's called Invest Her Directory to find those companies. So come see me after if you want to learn more. So buy. <laughs> buy from us. Thank you so much, Anne. <laughs> Paolo, you are the CEO of Procter & Gamble Italy. Uh, we know that Procter & Gamble is very committed to gender equity. Can you share with us a little bit the company vision you have on gender equity at Procter & Gamble? Yes. Thank you, Inge. So yes, we are 
very committed in driving gender equality inside the company and outside the company. Uh, when it comes to, and we have been working on this since many, many years. Uh, when it comes to inside the company, let me share a few numbers on where we are, because we start from objectives and then we want to enable the organization to get there. Uh, globally, 48% of our managers are female. Okay. When you go at one level up, higher level, so the CEOs of the different sectors, we have already equal representations of male and female, and when it comes even to independent board of directors or the board of directors of PNG globally, we are equally represented 50% and 50%. If we want to go to the Italian reality, which I know uh, quite well, where we are today, today we are at managerial levels, so leadership levels, 47%. Not yet to 50, but close to that. Um, and recently, to give you an example, we have two production plants here in Italy, and both production plants are led by uh, a woman. Interestingly, we are even ahead of the equal representation when it comes to recruiting. This year, in Italy, 60% of our newcomers are, are female. And this is quite important in a company that goes from promotion from within. Mm. It's important to attract the right percentage, and then it's very important to retain. And I go to the second point. How do we retain um, this equal representation, this female in, in the organization? Uh, and we do it by continuously reviewing our policies, our benefits through the lens of equality and intersectionality. Um, I can give you a couple examples maybe of, we are talking about best practices of what we do uh, in Italy on the retention side. Uh, we all know that one of the defining moments in the career of a woman is the period of maternity. It can be the first maternity, the second maternity. Maternity is always a critical, uh, a critical period. One of the policies we have introduced, and we have talked also in the other panels, uh, is a, a policy called share the care. This is in Italy, but we have it across the globe. In Italy, to all the fathers, we give eight weeks of fully paid parental leave to share the care with the mother. And the objective is not only to relieve the mother from this, but also culturally to pass the message that this is a shared responsibility between men. And the success has been extremely high, both across among men and among women. Another thing that we do, uh, and then I stop otherwise with practices, uh, another thing that we do is engaging men in this journey. It is extremely important that the journey, the journey through gender equality is not, it doesn't remain a female, a women problem, but it is a shared responsibility. And the way we try to include men through this is uh, we use a training which is, has been done by Catalyst, which is called Men Advocating for Real Change, Mark. If you don't know it, I suggest you to, to go through it. We, we send all the C-level and above managers of the company, male and female, to go through this training. And what you learn is uh, all the biases, all the uh, prejudice, all the privileges. Male have more than 100 privileges uh, that are not aware about. And I, this was a defining moment for me 10 years ago because you really realize you have to do something to include and to behave differently with, with female. Um, Thank you very much, Paul. Can you share with us a little bit what you are doing to accelerate women entrepreneurship in particular as PNG? Yes, definitely. Uh, so I talked to you about the, what we do internally. Now sharing what we do externally, uh, we are very committed in bringing an equal representation of male and female in our overall value chain. So it's not only the supply chain, we touch the supply chain, the creative chain, the innovation chain, and the sales chain. And we have recently committed to invest $10 billion over by 2025 in women-led or women-owned businesses across the world. Okay, this is, this is our commitment. That is amazing. It, and it represents 50% of the private sector commitment that happened in the Gender Equality Forum last June and 25% of, of the global one. And I hope more companies uh, will, will join us in this one. You always have to start with the commitment and then put in place the practices to get there. Uh, 
Now, if I go through the different legs of that supply chain, what we do in the supply chain, um, we spend today about $2 billion in women-led. Our objective is to move it to 10%, okay? In my sound, in my sound, just 10%, but you know what's the average today is 1%. Exactly. Is 1%. So that's a big deal. So it's, it's 10 times what, we, what, what is the average today. Um, but also on the other hand, while we commit, we want also to put in place practices that help uh, others to, to, to join the party. Uh, and one example is we have developed with the help of Kearney uh, a tool, a digital tool, which is called the Inclusive Sourcing Journey. Okay, it's a digital tool that is for our suppliers who want to join to get a, a flavor of where they stand in their journey towards equality, to get a benchmark, and to learn what needs to be true to, to, to improve in that sense. We have had 50 suppliers joining us so far, but again, please join the party. Um, creative chain, okay, we are one of the, best, of the biggest advertising spenders in the world, and we want to get equal gender representation also there, not only in front of the camera, okay, but also behind the camera. So 50% of our advertising will be directed by, by women. Other example, innovation chain touches you uh, um, quite a lot. We, are, we believe that the next billion dollar business will come from a women-led startup. So we are investing also to support startups in this journey. And we are not doing this only by financing. We are doing this by helping the startups to succeed in their journey to, to growth. I give an example that, Inge, you know uh, uh, quite well. It's uh, Women Entrepreneurs for Good. It's, it's a partnership we have initiated um, this year with Women Forum, with HSC School of Paris. Um, and we have uh, invited many startups in Italy, Germany, and France uh, who are investing, led by women, who are investing uh, in the uh, sustainability uh, area. Uh, to pitch for a uh, support program to succeed in the future. We had more than 200 startups joining the pitch. Nine have been selected, and now they are going through the incubator, Russia Se Paris. They are going through a five months program where really we help them to succeed, both in the financing phase, but also in the business phase uh, in the future. We really hope we will have a second edition with more, more companies to join us there. I can continue uh, another um, example. We have developed in the UK a PNG Academy for suppliers. It is an academy open to all the suppliers in the world. They want to learn what needs to be true to, to improve and to, to grow the business in, in, in the future, learning from PNG experiences. We have run this through 15 countries and more than 420 uh, startups have, have joined it. Um, I, can, I can give you another example, if you want. A brand, one, <laughs> Italy, very Italian. A brand, Pantene, brand leader in hair care in Italy. Same, supporting startups. We opened the pitch with Women Forum support and Chiara Ferragni, a pitch to the best young startups. We want to support them and make them succeed. We have had more than 1,600 startups, Italian startups, get into the pitch. We have selected the finalists, and on October 27, we will share the winner that will get our support. I stop here, otherwise you kill me. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for, for your commitment yeah. to women entrepreneurship. Monica, you are the CEO of Bayer in Italy, and you're also the first woman being nominated as a president of the Chamber, Italian-German Chamber of Commerce. So congratulations, actually, to you. Uh, Bayer has pursuing innovation for a long time already. I think it's quite historically, but more recently, I think you really encourage, as I understand, innovation and entrepreneurship towards digital transformation, also to help to accelerate the time lag between changes. So can you share a little bit more with us um, how you are doing this and the role of women entrepreneurs in this? Okay, thank you. Thank you for you know, giving the opportunity to share a bit in short time, cautious of time, but just to tell you 
what it means innovation uh, in an area as a strategic area as Bayer has chosen to position itself on, which is life sciences. As, as you mentioned, we've been in innovating since our you know, foundation because Bayer was not born with health or aspirin. We were born with pure chemicals. So since then, portfolio has been revised very, very deeply. So coming to these days, we are working and focusing on two areas, which are nutrition and health which are very high in the agenda of the Sustainable Development Goals of the United States and for sure two topics of systemic relevance. Now, to achieve innovation uh, in those areas which are definitely of great relevance for all of us, uh, connection with external environment and participating and fostering an ecosystem where many players can come in and bring innovative mindset, technologies and innovative research is key and crucial. So we have launched recently uh, two programs. I would just mention those two. One is a, prog a program called LEAPS, uh, where we want to have a dedicated unit who invest in uh, breakthrough technologies, scouting the market for really uh, paradigm shifting advances in life sciences. So we partner with external companies, with startups, with um, companies where are different stage in terms of their um, cycle of life, really to, to make a quantum leap, and this is where leaps come from, in, in 10 challenges for humanities. I mentioned just one, like Parkinson disease. So this is a kind of goals we want to achieve through this program. The second program launched back in 2013 is a program named Grants for Up. Uh, it's a partnering program for digital health. Um, so we have contacts with external startups where they obviously apply and we chose the startups we collaborate with to really advance uh, in digital health and digital transformation supporting health. We have many pro features in these programs, can be an advanced track for mature companies, a growth track for early market stage, companies at early market stage, or we look for co-investments. So it's really an ecosystem where science, businesses, investments get connected and get together to make a shift in innovation and, and pushing forward. What we observe is coming to women entrepreneurs is that definitely women or women-led businesses or startups are uh, fewer, way fewer than male-led uh, companies applying for all these programs. And one of the points, still pain points, is for them to access funding and financial funding. Um, if you look at data, both from the EU and also Italian data, as we are in Italy, looking at data from EU, only 11% uh, of uh, uh, companies getting venture capital support are led by women. And if you deep dive into startups within high tech, only 2% are led by women or founded where a woman is a co-founder. Uh, when you come to Italy, uh, an interesting data point I found is that uh, among uh, requesters for funding, 54% of women are asked to present also a third party guaranteeing for them when they ask for a loan, while then percentage goes down to 39% when it comes to men. So I know there are some representatives of the yep. banking and financial yep. system in the room. Uh, so that can be also part of the call to action we may discuss later, because there is still some bias to overcome, also some training to deliver to women when it comes to deal with investment. But this is definitely key to make a progress in the leap. How we can encourage women to do more entrepreneurship, to dare more? Would you share some ideas with us? Uh, yeah, I think there are numbers of uh, actions. There are role modeling, because it's cultural. Uh, there is encouraging women to, uh, to undertake STEM studies. We have been discussing also yesterday about science, technology, more of them, because also if you look at data for inventors and patents, women are still a very low percentage of them. And then maybe having, you know, specific targeted funding programs for women, specific advisory, mm -hmm. consulting them on investment, and train them to whatever can help them facilitate to access the capital market. So learn to dare, so to say. Learn to dare. <laughs> Thank you so much, Monica.
Um, Alessio Botta, you are the senior partner at McKinsey. Uh, McKinsey does a lot of wonderful research, and you have done some research very, very recently uh, on uh, startups working with corporates on, on innovation. The study actually has a very nice name. Can you tell us a little bit more about the research results? say funding is not just financial funding but it's also buying right and uh, one important element of buying is not just the b2c but it's also the b2b and this is one area where corporates and startups uh, as was also highlighted by paolo can uh, collaborate more okay in terms of uh, the corporates buying more from startups and scale ups and indeed, this is uh, something that we are being analyzing, uh, let me say, on uh, a, very, uh, a very regular basis. So if you think about Europe, for instance, in Europe we produce, as Europeans, around 36% of the global startups, which is our fair share if you compare to the GDP share of Europe. But we produce only 14% of the unicorns, so less than half, which is much less than the GDP share. There are many reasons for this. Some reasons uh, rely on the fact that we have uh, a fragmented market in Europe, we have a gap in talents, uh, uh, and there is a funding gap. But we believe that uh, uh, B2B relationships between startups and corporates could fill some of these gaps, right? So we've done uh, specific research in Italy. We have surveyed 80 startups and we've spoken to a number of uh, corporate executives in innovation. What we found is that uh, almost every startup, more than 90% of them, they look for corporate partnerships because they want to solve their market and funding issues, not just by capital, which is important, still very important, <laughs> but also with B2B relationships, which will sustain the revenues. The other point is that less than half of them, less than 40%, actually manage to establish such corporate relationships. And it's also interesting that uh, when you ask to the startups that proactively are looking for corporate relationships, how do they look for this? They look for this through uh, personal networking. So the second uh, channel is conferences and events uh, and ranks uh, 20 percentage points less uh, than the net personal networking. So personal networking is still extremely important. And if I link it to what Anne was saying uh, about uh, uh, a daughter and, his son, and their son, I mean, this is very important, right? Because uh, there are net business networks which are male dominated, and so it's much easier to develop personal networking and then to access not only to funding, but also to B2B relationships. I think it's, I mean, if you look from the other angle, it's very important. We have heard from two CEOs, but now, so I these partnerships are particularly important. They can look for new ideas, they can look for new ways of working, they can look for reputation, and I think also, I mean, uh, there is an improvement in the access to talents that is also highly needed by corporates. So I think this is an area where, let's say, we are trying to bring the focus of the discussion on problem on the... There might be some. Yeah, okay. it's okay. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. It's okay. So thank you very much, Alessio, for sharing these results. I think it's very interesting research, actually. Uh, so what can be done? Uh, yeah. What do you think can we do collectively? We heard about the ecosystem approach. What can we do all together in order to support women entrepreneurship? So our view is that we need to solve for two issues which are related, uh, but quite different. First, uh, we need to create a more effective innovation ecosystem uh, for everyone, not just for women. So the access to funding, the B2B relationships, this is something that needs to be, let me say, stimulated uh, at 360 uh, degree, not just for women. It's relevant for the economy at large. And I will not enter into this because it's not, uh, let me say, the scope of our panel. But the second element is then when we have uh, an effective and efficient uh, innovation ecosystem and entrepreneurial ecosystem, then we need to create a level play field uh, so that women entrepreneurs can be successful in this new ecosystem. 
Uh, let me make an example of something, uh, of some of our experience on this. Uh, in Italy, we're collaborating with a very important accelerator, it's called the B-Heroes, uh, and they also have a specific accelerator for uh, women-led startups, which is called B-Wonder. By the way, I mean, uh, I encourage you to have a look at the, 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 the accelerator is currently ongoing. We have great startups there. And we are helping them with this, uh, with this accelerator. And uh, our focus is on uh, um, women leadership program and uh, uh, soft skills creation. Okay, so we're helping these young entrepreneurs uh, on uh, creating their skills uh, and connecting to the senior corporate executive world. So a couple of feedbacks from the participants. So first of all, the gender gap in corporate is still there but it's much less than the gender gap in entrepreneurs. So I think there is an opportunity for senior executives, especially women executives, to give, gap, to give back to entrepreneurs on this. And the second element, uh, as I said before, is that the personal networking, unfortunately, I would say, is key. So I mean, as part of this mentoring and relationships, opening up the networks and introducing also for business opportunities, B2C, as Anne was saying, but also B2B is extremely important. So a call to action for everybody in the room, uh, senior executive, uh, policy makers, uh, take the commitment uh, to connect to at least one young woman entrepreneur and try to develop a relationship to open your personal network because they need this for their B2B activity and they need also a lot of mentorship on women leadership because in the executive world, in the corporate world, this is something that has started to be tackled a, a bit earlier than in, in the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Thank you so much, Alessio. I know that you're passionate about this, so thank you for sharing. We're almost at the end of our, of our panel. Paolo, I would like to hand over again to you that we take a few minutes to think about why it is so important to have women uh, startups, women-led startups, women in leadership position. Why it is so important to, to business overall? Yeah, that's a, an excellent question. Um, I have been working in, uh, in PNG for more than 20 years, and it is more than 20 years that we pursue gender equality in the company, and we do it not only because it is the right thing to do, but because it delivers better business results. Let's not forget about it. It delivers better business results. And there are plenty of studies. You quoted a few here, so I don't, I, I don't need to convince you that this is the case. But let me add a, another, a new perspective, another angle on why we need to accelerate women in leading positions in, in, in companies and women-led uh, startups uh, is if you look at the what are the characteristics of a leader in the near future okay not very far tomorrow I can also say today uh, in the post pandemic world I mean if you look at the major disruption we have been living in before the pandemic and during the pandemic the digital disruption we have lived through 250 years of of the, of technological evolution in 10 years in addition to that, the pandemic, which in addition to the digital disruption, has had some social disruptions, right? To, to name a few, the digital people living between the, the real world and the digital world, the info obesity, the eco-anxiety, people now expect companies to make the world get recovered from, from, from the, the, the environment situation. Um, and all these disruptions, uh, create a business context which is much more complex than before, much more non-linear from a real mathematical point of view. What does it mean? It means that leaders cannot rely on their experience to solve the issues. I cannot look at my past experiences to solve the challenges I have today. There is nothing in my past experience. So the leaders of the very likely, the emerging strategies to to solve the issues and the challenges of the future will come from the bottom of the organization or from the startups, if you want, as a parallel. And so the leader of the future cannot be the smartest person in the room. If he is the smart or she is the smartest person in the room, he or she is in the wrong room. It means that he doesn't have the right team 
to support him or her. So the leader of the future, first of all, has to put for sure the ego in the drawer, okay? And we know that male are not great in, in doing that, okay? Um, and then he needs to have a clear vision on one side. He or she needs to have a clear vision on one side, but on the other hand, he or she needs to be humanized. Think about generation, the generations that will be the workforce in 2030, just to add another one, Generation Z. Honestly, they want to have a work-life balance. They want to have a purpose in their job. They want to understand the meaning of their job. So, and, and so all those, the characteristics of the leader of the future are statistically, for sure, closer to women than to men. It doesn't mean that men don't have them, but a, a man needs to have around him a good leadership team that is well female represented. Because women, we know, they care much more on what people make them grow. They, are very, they put very high in their, in their agenda all the social and sustainability topics. They care about work-life balance. So, uh, and this is a, a perspective, a new perspective or an, a, another perspective to somehow really push companies to accelerate in this uh, equality at all levels in the organization. Otherwise, business results will not come anymore. Thank you so much, Paolo, really. Um, we'd like to end this panel with a collective uh, call to action. We would like to involve you. <laughs> um, we have seen that actually a whole ecosystem in, is necessary to support women entrepreneurs and this future of women entrepreneurship. Um, it has been said yesterday during the CEO champion session, it's up to me. I think we can all contribute to this. We have heard so many call to actions, example about startups, supporting women entrepreneurs and innovation. We heard about supporting programs for women entrepreneurs. We heard about being a business angel. We have heard about buy from women entrepreneurs. Make your innovation system an inclusive one within your company. So if you just take a few seconds and you think about, would there be any action we have mentioned today collectively you will be able to implement in the next week? Why not tomorrow? Would you like to commit to support women entrepreneurs? Please raise your hand. If you have any action in mind you can take in the forthcoming days, would like to commit to women entrepreneurs. So I can commit HEC to do this. Are there other commitments in the room to support women entrepreneurs? Oh, that's not good enough. We're the women's <laughs> <Yeah>. forum here. <laughs> Thank you Thank so you. much with this wonderful picture of people supporting and companies and corporates. Yes, raise your hands for the photo. Thank yeah. you. Committing to support women entrepreneurs. Thank you so much to my distinguished panel for this wonderful conversation. We had a gender-balanced panel, actually. I'm so happy. Thank you very much for coming and for time, for your time. And thank you to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have a group photo. <laughs> Do we stand here for, just let us know.